2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So I'm continuing, in, continuing on from Sunday sermon. Okay, so I'm asking you to take your minds back four days ago, try to refresh your minds as to what I preached, because I don't want to cover it all again, right? I'm just building. These are the leftovers from Sunday. <laughs> all right, I did have leftovers. So we're just building on from what we've learned. I will cover some of the things again, just to refresh our memories, but not in too much detail. But the title of tonight's sermon is Our Gathering Together Unto Him. Our Gathering Together Unto Him. Now we get the title of that, sermon, uh, that message here in uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren. So Paul is writing to the Thessalonians church. I beseech you, brethren. Pay attention, brethren, he's saying. By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now, do you see how Paul, again, associates the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with the gathering together unto him, gathering together unto Jesus Christ, okay? So the gathering, Matthew 24, remember, people say it's not for us. It talks about the gathering. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about the gathering, and it's called the coming of the Lord, and it's being written to the Thessalonian church, right? To the New Testament church believers. Verse number 2 that ye, and pay attention, let's read this slowly. Why is Paul saying, pay attention? Why is he saying this? Verse number two, that ye be not soon shaken in mind. I don't want you to be shaken in mind. I want you to be focused, right? I want you to be stable. I want you to be established or be troubled. I don't want you to be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us. So I don't want you to be deceived. I don't want you to be shaken. I don't want you to be troubled. Even if some spirit comes to you or some word, some, some epistle, something that looks like the Bible comes to you or a letter as from us, if it has my own name on it, I don't want you to be troubled. Why? As that the day of Christ is at hand. Okay? He doesn't want people to be troubled thinking that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, what does it mean? What does, it, what, what does this mean? First of all, day of Christ, immediately we should recognize, going back to verse number one, that the day of Christ is the gathering together, is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should recognize that, and I'll prove that to you in a minute, that is true. But the trouble is, people were saying that the day of Christ, that the rapture, they were saying, was at hand. That was the problem. That was what Paul says, don't be troubled by that. Okay? Don't be uh, deceived. Don't be shaken. What does it mean to be at hand? If I say something's at hand, what am I saying? I'm saying that it's close, right? It's nearby, right? That it can happen soon, that it can be imminent at any moment. That's what at hand means. Don't be troubled by that, okay? Now, what are you going to find across 99% of independent fundamental Baptist churches? That the day of Christ is at hand. That's what they're teaching. The day of Christ is at hand. They're teaching that it's imminent. It can happen at any moment. Paul says, don't be troubled by that. Don't, don't be fooled by that, right? That's, not, that's why I'm writing this to you. So you pay attention, he's saying, right? Don't be fooled. Don't be thinking that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, let me just prove to you that the day of Christ is a reference to the rapture. It's the same thing, because some people want to say to you that it's not. Let me just show you a couple of verses. I'll just read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. You don't need to turn there. I'll just read it out to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 7 to 8 says, So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, pay attention now, to the coming, waiting for that, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So what's the end as far as a believer is concerned? The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He says, I want you to be blameless for that day, right? It'll be very embarrassing for Christians if we're worldly, we don't care about the things of God, and Christ comes back. We're going to be ashamed of ourselves if we haven't been serving the Lord. Now, we're going to heaven if you're saved, amen, but you're going to be ashamed that he's coming. And Paul is encouraging people, hey, um, you know, uh, wait, wait for the coming of the Lord, which is the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, verse 5 and 6, also the same thing. This is what uh, Paul says to the Philippian church, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. So what's the fellowship in the gospel? The gospel is what saves us, right? So he's saying to the Philippian church, from the time of our fellowship together in the gospel 
from the first day. So the first day you were saved until now, so until the time that he's writing this, from the time that I was saved till now when the time I was writing this, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, when was that good work when you got saved, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What's the day of Jesus Christ? The rapture, right? God's going to continue to work for us until he's coming back. That's the promise that Paul says to the Philippian church. From the time you were saved till now, Christ will continue working till the day of Jesus Christ in your life. Okay? So we can see that the day of Jesus Christ and his coming are one and the same thing. Okay? We, we have further evidence uh, from that from other passages. But back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Again, Paul continues this uh, concept. He says, let no man deceive you. Okay, because they were being troubled, right? They were being troubled. People were telling them, hey, the day of Christ can happen at any moment. It's around the corner. It's so soon. He says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day? That day shall not come. What day? We just finished reading about the day of Christ. What is the day of Christ? The gathering of the believers, the rapture, the resurrection, right? For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, first of all, the falling away, I, I'm not going to spend time on this, but that's, about, that's apostasy. Okay? That's where people fall away from the truth. The truth is available to people, and they fall away from that. Okay? They turn their backs from the truth, and they turn their backs against God. That is apostasy. That is the falling away. We can have discussions about that all day long. But the other key thing, not only does that have to happen before the day of Christ comes, but also, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. What does perdition mean? Damnation. This son of damnation. This this antichrist that that, um, is who it is, the beast. Now what does this person do? So the day of Christ cannot come till the falling away, and this son of perdition is revealed. Okay, This man of sin, the son of perdition. What does he do? Who opposeth, okay, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you guys remember when that takes place from from Sunday's sermon? Remember the abomination of desolation? Remember that happens in the middle of the seven week period, three and a half years, right? The Antichrist comes, we read this in Daniel. He exalts himself above the God of gods. He makes himself out to be God and he blasphemes against God. That is his revealing. That is his revealing. We know that the day of Christ, the rapture, cannot come till the Antichrist reveals himself. Okay? And that revealing isn't just, oh, I think, you know, I think, uh, what's the American president's name right now? Trump. You know, it's not, oh, Trump's the Antichrist. No, it's when some guy, like a Trump, like a, like a big politician or a big warlord or someone, who knows, puts himself up and says, I am God. That's the revealing, all right? That's the revealing. Um, so pay attention to that. That's what Paul is reaffirming, which lines up perfectly with what Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24, right? He says, the abomination and desolation must happen, then there's great tribulation, and then the sun and moon go dark, the stars, stars fall from heaven, and the coming of Christ happens. Now, I just want to bring that to your thought, because again, I'm trying to reinforce this idea that these teachings are for the New Testament church. This was a teaching given to the Thessalonians. They weren't unsaved Jews. Okay? They were saved Jews and saved Gentiles in this church. Okay? They were part of the New Testament church. Now turn to Revelation chapter 1. Sorry, Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Because now what I want to do, we already saw that Revelation 1-7, the coming in Revelation 1-7, and the coming in Matthew 24, and the coming in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, are all the one coming of Christ. We saw all the similarities between those passages, right? Christ coming in the clouds. But now I want to take one step further. I want to show you the similarities between Matthew 24 and Revelation chapter 6. Okay? Because this is where John... Okay, I don't know if you know this, but in the, in the uh, Gospels, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke 
all record the teaching of the Mount of Olives. They all record that. The only one that doesn't record it is John. But yet, where does he record it himself? In the book, of, he wrote the book of Revelation as well as the book of John. So he records the teaching from a different perspective. If you guys know the book of Revelation, he was caught up into the spirit, into heaven. He was given this prophetic vision by God. He was taken into the future, if you will, and saw these events come to pass. And then we get to Revelation chapter 6. Okay? Before I read Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 5 is about this scroll that nobody can open, right? It's got these seven seals. And John starts to weep because nobody can open it, right? And then comes a lamb. He takes it from the one on the throne. And the lamb has the ability, the lamb of God, Jesus Christ, has the ability to unravel this scroll. He has the ability to unlock these seals. And now Christ comes, he takes this book and begins to show this book, begins to read from this book. Now, before I start reading this, the pre-tree believers will tell you that the scroll, this scroll is Christ pouring out his wrath on the world. They teach that this is the tribulation period and Christ is bringing the tribulation upon the world. Now, all Christ is doing is loosening these scrolls and I'm assuming reading it, right, showing what's, what's taking place. Then John looks and sees, yeah, these things are taking place on the earth. The difference with the scroll and then, you, you know, you've got the trumpets and you've got the vials, if you guys know the book of Revelation. I'm not going to go into the trumpets and the vials in any great detail. The difference between that is you've got Christ doing this, but the trumpets being blown and the vials being poured are all done by angels. Okay? Not only are they done by angels, but something is being expelled, whether that's the sound of the trumpet or if it's the vials being poured out. Something's being expelled onto the earth. Here, the seals are just being opened and revealed to us through Christ. And I'll show you as we read through this that Christ is not the one pouring out his wrath at this point in time. Okay. Now, actually what I need you to do is keep your finger in Revelation chapter 6 and turn to Matthew 24. I need you to go back and forth. Okay. So Matthew 24, keep one finger in Revelation 6 and go to Matthew chapter 24. And just, we'll flick through that a bit. I'll give you a second to get to Matthew 24. Okay, Matthew 24. Go back to Revelation chapter 6. Let's read the first two verses. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. So you've got the Lamb, you've got Jesus Christ with this scroll. And I saw the Lamb opened one of the seals. And I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So once this first seal is unlocked and revealed, we see this white horse. Now, you guys might be familiar with the term the horseman of Revelation, or the horseman of the apocalypse. Okay? This is what it's referring to. There are these four horsemen and four horses that transpire with these, these uh, seals, the first four seals being loosened. But the first horse is a white horse, and there's a person sitting on that white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So this person that's been revealed is the Antichrist. Look at Matthew 24, verse 5. I just want to show you a few similarities here. Matthew 24, verse 5. Remember, the disciples came to Jesus and asked them, hey, tell us about your second coming. Tell us about the end, right? Tell us about the end of the world. Jesus says to him in verse 5, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, Revelation chapter 19, guess who else comes on a white horse? Very clearly, Lord Jesus Christ comes, back on, a, comes on a white horse. Who do we have coming on a white horse when that first seal is revealed? Jesus Christ, if we compare these passages, false Christs. Okay, remember I told you these false Christs, um, there's accumulation to the Antichrist, the one that exalts himself above all gods. He comes riding on this white horse. He has authority. He has power. And he goes forth conquering the nations. Okay, he's taking over. Now, whether that's in war or just, you know, uh, uh, remember what it said in, in Daniel that he shall con confirm a covenant with many? 
whether that's just him, him making, because a covenant just means an agreement. So whether that means he's making all these peace agreements and all these uh, uh, confederations together, joining the, the world together, that's what he's doing. He's conquering the world. Okay? At this point, it may not yet be by war, but we'll see shortly that it is by warfare. Revelation chapter 6, verse 3. Revelation chapter 6, verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse. So this is the second horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So now this, instead of a white horse, we have a red horse. And the one that's on this horse has the power to what? Take peace from the earth, right? Peace now. At first, the conquering, that's what I'm saying, the conquering in the first seal was probably a peaceful you know, agreement between nations. Now, he's conquering with the sword. Peace has been removed, and people are killing one another, and unto this one on the, uh, on the horse was given him a great sword. What's the, what's, what's the sword? It's a weapon of warfare, right? It's a weapon of killing, of fighting, of war. This second horse, the second horseman, represents warfare on the world. Go back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 6. Because after Christ said there'll be false Christ, what's the next thing that he said in verse number 6? Matthew 24, verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Do you see how these things come together? Matthew 24 and Revelation chapter 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. You can see world warfare, right? It's not just local wars. It says uh, uh, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, right? And then we have uh, back to Revelation chapter 6 verse 4. And power was given him to, that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. This is why many people believe this is a world war, because peace is taken from the whole earth. Nations against nations. Kingdoms against kingdoms. Maybe people are resisting the Antichrist from taking power. And so he has to take, you know, take control of that through warfare rather than by peaceful means. Back to Revelation chapter 6, verse 5. Verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And behold, lo, a black horse. Now the, the third horse is a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Okay, so these balances, these, these things to weigh. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. See that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now what is that about? What is that about? We get a bit more clarity when we go back to Matthew 24. Look at verse 7. So we did read, in verse 7, we read, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines. That's the next thing that Jesus says. There shall be famines. Now why, is this, why does this link back to Revelation chapter 6? It's because a penny back in those days, a penny was your day's wage. Okay, someone that worked a full-time job, approximately you'd receive a penny for your, for your efforts. Let's say today it's $150 a day, something like that maybe, for a full day's wage. With $150 Australian dollars, you will be able to buy a measure of wheat, a, a small amount of wheat, right? Now, with two days of work, I can probably provide for my, my family of 12, right? Well, we're not 12 yet. Well, I, I guess Christina feeds for herself and the baby. I guess it is. It's 12, yeah? <laughs> I'm losing track of how many. Yeah, it will be 12. You know, I can probably feed my family, let's say on, on a day's wage, probably for half a week, approximately, roughly like that, right? But this will be just for a small amount of wheat. What's that? That's not going to get through, you know, for a larger family anyway, that's not going to provide much. Also, that same penny, that same day's wage, will, will be able to provide for three measures of barley. So you get a bit more barley than you do wheat. So wheat to make, not to make bread, okay? A, a, a loaf of bread, let's say. A loaf of bread, what does that cost? $2, $3, $4, you know, if you get the good stuff, $5. It's going to cost you $150 day's wage to get that piece of that bread. Why? Because there's famine on the earth, right? There's famine on the earth. People, uh, and money loses its value when it can't, cannot purchase 
what it needs to purchase, right? This hyperinflation, the, 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 um, the value of your money has deteriorated to the fact that you can only buy a bit of wheat. There's famines on the earth. You can see that correlation there with Revelation chapter 6 and Matthew 24. Now look at verse number 6 in Revelation 6. Sorry, uh, verse 7. Revelation 6, verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And lo and behold, a pale horse. Now, before I keep reading, when you, when you see someone that is pale, what do you think about that person? Like, if I'm up here and you see my face, like my face loses color, you're going to think I'm sick, right? You're going to think there's something wrong with you, right? I, I remember many times that I've gone to work, you know, my old workplace, not feeling the best. People would say to me, Kevin, you look pale. You don't look yourself, you know, you've lost color in your face. That's the same idea. This pale horse brings sickness. And lo and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part, fourth part of the earth. So there's this sickness to kill with, with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. People now are, are dying through various means. Through the sword. We already know about that. Through, through warfare. With hunger. Why? Because there's the famines. With death. And with the beasts of the earth. So you even have the animals going wild, right? There's not enough... Uh, I'm, I'm assuming... The animals don't have enough food for themselves. And they're going, the wild beasts are attacking human beings at this point in time. And of course, if you look back to Matthew 24, verse 7, Matthew 24, verse 7, we said, and there, sh and there shall be famines and pestilences. What are pestilences? Sicknesses, right? Deadly diseases taking place in this time, which lines up with the pale horse. Because that is what it's representing, right? These pestilences, these sickness plus there's all, all this other death that's taking place. What, what do you have when people are dying across the world? You know, they're probably not being buried. It's a time of warfare. That's where bodies start to rot. You know, insects come and spread all kinds of diseases, all kinds of, you know, things. That's what's taking place during this period. So you have these four horses, these four horsemen, right? And then look at Matthew 24, verse 7. Again, Matthew 24, verse 7. And pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places, verse 8. And these are the beginning of sorrows. Pay attention to that. These are the beginning of sorrows. If you remember back to Sunday, that leads up all the way to the midpoint, to the abomination of desolation, when the Antichrist reveals himself. So even though the Antichrist is active on the scene, we don't know of him exactly. We don't know who this is, right? This can be anybody, but he's revealed at the time of the abomination of desolation when he exalts himself above God, right? Because we have politicians, we have kingdoms that have conquered kingdoms, we have people raise up and bring peace in different parts of the world, okay? We can't always say, well, someone's doing that, they must be the Antichrist. No, you only know that when he exalts himself above the God of gods. But notice, notice that all of this is called the beginning of sorrows. Why? Because a change takes place after the beginning of sorrows. That's the great tribulation. That's the exalt, when the Antichrist exalts himself, right? And... Revelation chapter 6 follows suit with us. Because if you look at, Rev well, uh, uh, sorry, are you still in Matthew 24? Matthew 24 verse 9. It says there, because after the beginning of sorrows, it says this, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Okay? So instead of this just affecting the whole world, now they're persecuting you. Now they're afflicting you. Now they're killing you, Christian. Okay? This is what's going on. So we would expect when we go back to Revelation chapter 6 that we're going to find the same thing take place, right? When the next seal is open. Go back to Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal... Now, are we going to see another horse here? No, we're not. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. You see that? Christ says, beginning of sorrows, that's done with, then they're going to afflict you. Then they're going to kill you, right? What do we see in Revelation chapter 6? The beginning of sorrows was represented by those four horsemen. That, that analogy is done away with now. Now, there are these souls that were uh, 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 killed for um, Christ's name. Wait, what, sorry, what does it say there? Uh, they were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held and what did Matthew 24 say? Why were they killed? For my name's sake. And these two things go together. 
And then in Revelation, uh, chapter, verse number 10 in Revelation chapter 6, and they cried. So these souls that were killed are under this altar. I'm trying to get this heavenly picture here. I, I'm assuming it's a big altar, right? All these souls under this altar um, cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Let's pause here for a minute. Has Jesus Christ been pouring out his wrath on the, on the earth at this point? The pre tribbers will say he has. But what do these people, what do these saints say? How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? They're saying, hey, how long till you start doing something on the earth? They're praying to God. When are you going to do this? Right? They're asking him. So has Christ been pouring out his wrath? Has God been uh, pouring out his anger upon this earth? Has he been destroying the earth? Not at this point in time. Right? That's why they're asking, how long? How long more do we have to wait? Verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them. It's interesting that these souls, without a physical body, are able to put on robes. Anyway. And white robes were, were given unto one of them, to every one of them, and it was said unto them, that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were, uh, should be fulfilled. So, you know, the, 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 the idea here is give them white robes of righteousness, right? And wait, wait a little more, just a little season. There's a few more people that are going to die for the name of Christ. Okay, once that's accomplished, then, then we're going to take care of business, right? So we see, and the other thing is, that's all we learn about in the fifth seal. That's all we learn about, these souls that are slain. And so people that's, that are saying, well, Christ, you know, Christ is pouring out his wrath, he's doing all this. Well, all that happens in the fifth seal is saints being killed. So are you going to tell me that Christ killed his own people? You know, is, he, is Christ just murdering his own people? You know, people, pre-tribbers pre say to me, because I believe we're going through the tribulation, they say, oh, so are you saying, you know, Christ is going to beat up on his wife? Is Christ a wife beater? I don't know if you've ever heard that. Well, it's, it's better to be beaten up than to be murdered. Because <laughs> if they're saying Christ is doing this, then you're saying Christ is murdering his people. Right? I mean, wouldn't you rather just be beaten up a little bit than, than, than being murdered? So, you know, that doesn't carry weight at all, what they say. But we can see Christ has not yet done anything to the earth. He has not avenged the blood of his people just yet. Let's look at uh, chapter, uh, verse 12, sorry. Revelation 6, 12. And be... And I beheld, and he opened the sixth seal. Now, this is where it all gets really, you know, action-packed. Or it's been action-packed till now, but this is where it gets really exciting. And, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Do you guys remember that? Remember the sun, the moon, the stars? Verse 13. And the stars of heaven fell onto the earth. Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now, what, this is what I believe. See how it says the fig tree casteth the figs? Like the figs are falling off the fig tree? But it calls those figs um, untimely figs. So they're not figs that are ripe just yet. And I believe that ties in with Jesus saying, you know, that the days shall be shortened. Because he probably had a time set for all of this. But because he shortens that time, it's kind of this idea of the figs not yet being fully ripened. And so they're untimely and they fall off that tree when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And then verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll. Okay, let's stop there. So we have the sun going dark, we have the moon turning to blood, and the stars fall from heaven. Right? That lines up with Matthew 24. Okay? Then, as soon as that happens, what are we to do? Remember Sunday? We're to lift up our heads for our redemption draweth nigh. Remember that? We expect Christ to come. Christ says he will come like, the, like lightning from the east to the west, how it shines. It says in verse number 14, And the heaven departed as a scroll. We see the, the sky, it opens up like a scroll. It rolls back like a scroll. You know how a scroll, those old, you know, old, old time scrolls, they were kind of together, and then to read them, they had to roll it open like that. I don't know if you guys have seen videos of that. They, they, well, that's the same thing. The sky just opens up. <laughs> the sky just opens up. It parts as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Wow. This, this earthquake, 
Not only we get more information here than Matthew 24, this massive earthquake just shakes the whole earth. Verse 15. Now pay attention to this. What were the people? Remember all the people? What were they doing? Remember when we read about it, they were mourning, they were wailing. Remember that? What do we find in verse 15? And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, everyone hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us. Pay attention to their words. Fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. Who do they see when the heaven is departed as a scroll? They see the face of the one that sitteth on the throne. They see Christ come. Every eye shall see him. Remember, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. They see Christ. And they're so fearful. They're praying to the mountains and to the rocks. They're probably going in bunkers underground, what have you. They're saying, hide us. They're, they're talking to the, to the environment as though that it's going to protect them from God Almighty. From the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And now look, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus Christ. They know the wrath of the Lamb has come. They know it's time for the earth to face its consequences. For the great day of his wrath is come. That's present tense. The great day. This day. This day that we stand now. The sun and the moon have gone dark. The stars from, from heaven. This day. This day. The great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Do you see that? Now we start the wrath of God, right? This very day is going to be the start. The day when the sun and moon go dark and the heavens roll back. That day will be the start of God's wrath. Now, just to cover a couple of things very quickly, um, if you look at Revelation chapter 6, just because I've had this argument being brought forth to me, you see how it says the sun will be darkened as sackcloth of hair? I think it says there. Uh, and then it says the moon shall turn to blood. Uh, let me have a look at that. Yeah, the moon became as blood. But I'm going to read to you Matthew 24 quickly. I didn't have this in my notes, but just in case you get asked this question, uh, let's have a look. So it says here in Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. So some people have said to me, Kevin, these are different events. You have the sun going dark, you have the moon going dark, the stars falling from heaven in Matthew 24, but in Revelation 6 it says the moon turns to blood. So it's a different event, right? Now, it's not a... I mean, how many times do the stars fall from heaven? Both times the stars fall from heaven, right? But just because one says it, it goes dark, it loses its light, or goes dark, and one says it turns to blood, doesn't mean they're different events. It just means both things are happening. Like, for example, um, you know, if I had a... Let's say these lights, you know, let's say these lights, let's say that there's a power failure, it shorts out, it turn, one of them turns off and catches on fire. You know, you might go and say, well, the light caught on fire. And then someone else might say, well, the light went out. And then be like, well, hold on, which story is true? You know, these two different events. You know, just saying two things are happening, right? The sun, uh, sorry, the moon turns red, turns to blood. And it also, because it turns to blood, it loses its light. You know, it goes dark. So these things are one and the same. Don't let people make you think that they're different events, anything like that. It, it's fine. I don't, I, don't, I don't see a problem why the moon going into blood means that it has to keep shining, right? It just goes, it turns to blood and it goes dark. Uh, now, I'm going to read to you Acts chapter 2, verse 20. Acts chapter 2, verse 20. The Bible reads, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Okay? The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. So the sun and moon go dark first, then we know the day of the Lord has is come, right? That, that comes first, the sun and moon. So at this point in Revelation, the sun and moon go dark, where now? They're saying the wrath of God is, is, is come. It's come because it's the day of the Lord. Okay, it's the day of the Lord. If you know the Old Testament, you know the day of the Lord is a time of wrath. You know it's a time of darkness. You know it's a time that people are warned. It's, it's spoken of so much in the Old Testament. It's a time of God's wrath upon the world. Now I'm going to read to you another passage. Uh, you don't need to turn there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. Because I want to 
remember we talked about the day of Christ? Well, now we're talking about the day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Again, Thessalonians now, you know, Thessalonians in the second Thessalonians talks about the day of Christ. First Thessalonians talks about the day of the Lord. So cometh as a thief in the night. And then verse 4 says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that 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 that's that they should overtake you as a thief. So the day of the Lord. Okay. So what does that mean? This is what he means. We're to look for the day of the Lord. Okay? The same day that the day of the Lord begins, which is the wrath of God, is the same day as the day of Jesus Christ. Is the same day of, as Christ. The difference is, when he talks about the day of Christ, you'll notice in the Bible it's a very positive mention. It's, it's what we're looking for. Okay? We're waiting for the Lord to come. The day of the Lord Jesus Christ, where he finishes that good work in us. All very positive mentions about the day of Christ. But to the unbelieving world, to the world that's going to go for the wrath of God, to them, that is the day of the Lord, which is a day of darkness, day of wrath, day of God's great anger and judgment. Okay? Now, I'm not, I'm not fully... I, I've got to study up a little bit more. I'm not sure if the day of the Lord is just that, represents that one day, but I have seen some other passages that it might be a longer period of time. Regardless, whatever it is, it begins on that day. That same day that the sun and the moon are darkened, that's the day of Christ for the believers, because we know Christ is coming. We, the heavens rolled open, right? People saw Christ, but then they know the wrath of God has come upon them. The day of the Lord has come upon them. Now, look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. So we've had the six seals. Remember, this scroll has seven seals, okay? We haven't opened the seventh seal just yet. Now, all of these things, we know this day of the sixth seal is the day when God's wrath starts, Okay? But it hasn't started just yet in the reading of Revelation. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the wind should, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. So there are these four angels. They've got this amazing power that they have the ability to control the earth, the seas, the winds. Okay, they, uh, God's given these angels this power. And other, another angel comes and says to those four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying in verse 3, Hurt not the earth. Don't hurt the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till... So they are to hurt the earth, but not yet. Not till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Again, I just want to show you this because Christ has still not yet poured out his wrath on the earth. We know this day, this very day they're talking about is the day he's going to, going to start, but it's not commenced just yet. The angels are told, don't hurt the earth just yet. Okay? And what are they waiting for? For the 144,000, 12,000 from every tribe. Of, of Israel to have this on their foreheads, they're on the earth, and we won't go into that right now because that, that's just its own thing. Let's look at verse number 9. Verse number 9. So after this 144,000 appear on the scene, verse number 9, and after this, so after this happened, again, we're still on the same day of the sun and moon going dark, of the heavens being opened and Christ appearing. And after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds, what's kindreds? Families and people and tongues, all kind of languages, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne. What a great vision! All these people praising God. And then the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne in their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. What great worship to the God of gods. All this host of heaven just praising God, right? 
And then verse 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? Who are these people? Well, who are these, this great multitude? Right? But then look at the next question. And whence came they? What does whence mean? From where? You know, this elder comes and says, Where did they come from? Were they there all along? No, they just came out of nowhere, right? They, whence came they? Whence? From where? Thence? From there? Hence? From here? Just old English. Okay, lessons there for you. From whence? Where do they come from? Verse 14. And I said unto him, so John says to this elder, uh, maybe to a, this pastor, Sir, thou knowest. So he's saying, like, you know. Like, why are you asking me? I, I'm the one that's been caught up here in the spirit. I'm the one that's, you know, trying to contain everything that I can see. He says, you know, like, why are you asking me? You know where they came from. And he said unto me, what did he say unto them? These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Where did this great multitude come from? The great tribulation, being persecuted by the Antichrist. This is why so many of them had died during the fifth seal and more were to die, right? The great tribulation had taken place. We've read that in Matthew 24. They've come out of that. The robes are washed in the blood of the Lamb. You know, this, people say to you, this isn't us. Kevin, this, this isn't us. This is some other group. Some other group in future tribulation period. The tribulation saints, they call them. Something that's never coined or termed in the Bible. That's what they call them. They're not, it's not the church, it's tribulation saints. They're washed in the blood of the Lamb. If you've been saved, you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 15, and I'm going to prove to you that these people are, is the New Testament church. Okay, I'm going to prove that to you, maybe not just yet, but a little later. Verse 15, therefore, before the, uh, therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Praise God, God will dwell among us. Right? This isn't just some, you know, we go and preach the gospel, people tell us, I don't believe in God. You know, we, we, can't, we can't show them God, right? We can't produce God. But at this point, God will be with us, dwelling with us. We'll be able to see Him in His fullness. Praise God, what an amazing thing. And look at this, verse 16, And shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. Man, that's such a good thing on the Sunshine Coast. It's too much heat here. No more of that. <laughs> For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of water. Pay attention now. I want you to pay attention to these next words. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. All tears. All your stress. All your worries. Okay? All your problems on the earth. All your concerns. All your suffering. Washed away. Wiped away. God himself will wipe away those tears from your eyes. Never more to sorrow. Never more to mourn. God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. I want you to just retain that in your memory because we're going to cover that later on. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. Have we opened the seventh seal yet? No, not yet. We're still in the same day. Okay? It's still the same day of the sun and moon being darkened and the rapture taking place. Verse number one. And when he had opened the seventh seal, okay, so now the seventh seal is opened, there was silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. Silence, just everything goes quiet. People were praising God, worshipping God. God wiped all these tears. Now it goes quiet for half an hour. Um, it's kind of like this, this calm before the storm. right? Everything just goes quiet because we know what's going to happen, what's coming, the wrath of God. Verse number two, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God and to them were given seven trumpets. Remember this, guys. Remember this. The seventh seal is opened. Then what happens? The seven angels get the seven trumpets. Okay? Because there are some people... I don't know how people get this idea. They say, well, seal one goes with trumpet number one. Seal two goes with trumpet number two. They don't have the trumpets until the seventh seal is over. Okay? That's what's been revealed here in the seventh seal, is that these seven angels receive their trumpets. And, and, and to them were given seven trumpets. Verse 3, and, an angel, and another angel came and stood at the altar. Remember that altar where these souls that were slain were under? He comes to that same altar, having a golden censer, 
And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints. So this incense, I, I, I don't fully understand this picture, guys. But we see this angel coming to that throne. Remember what that throne was? The, the, the souls crying out, when are you going to avenge us? How long, Lord? How long do we have to wait? But not only that, all the prayers of the saints, the prayers of all saints upon that altar was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints. So the, these prayers, it's, like, it's kind of like God's been reserving all these prayers. Okay, And now it's time to answer these prayers. This, 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 these prayers come up to the Lord. Uh, uh, smoke of the incense which came to the presence of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer. Now look what he does. He takes the censer and filled it with fire from the altar. So somehow these prayers of the saints translates now into this fire in this altar and cast it into the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Before they start blowing the trumpets, God pulls out, this, the angel gets this fire, casts it onto this earth, and the earth reacts. All this, this thunderings, lightnings, earthquakes. Verse number six, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Wow. Silence. Then all of a sudden all these, these voices, I guess they're screaming on the, I don't know, screaming on the earth. Earthquakes, it, you know, the earth is shaken. And now the angels are about to sound the trumpets. We're not going to go into the wrath of God. You can read more about the trumpets there in verse number, uh, chapter, verse, chapter 8, if you want, in your own time. But you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of Romans chapter 12, verse 19 and 20. I'll just read it to you. Where it says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. So if someone does wrong to us, don't get revenge. Give, it, give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in, doing, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. I like the similarities there, right? These people that are being persecuted, God says, look, don't avenge yourself. Give the place to wrath, right? So, you know, do good to these people. And these, these, these coals of fire will be heaped upon their head. It just reminds me of the altar. You know, all these prayers of the saints. You know, they're not avenging themselves. They're asking the Lord to avenge them. And, and it kind of, it's this fire that this angel takes and casts it onto the earth. It's kind of like, it's, it's, it's sort of like God's just reserved that. And now he's, he's hearing all those prayers. And it's, it's like, all right, now's the time. <laughs> now we've got to sound the trumpets. Now we've got to pour out the wrath and destroy what there is. Such a scary thought for those that miss the rapture, right? You know, I, this is why we need to preach the gospel and get people saved so they can be part of this great rejoicing. So they can be part of the day of Christ rather than be part of the day of the Lord. Um, now, we won't, I won't be going into the, to the wrath at this point in time. Maybe it's, it needs its own sermon at some point. But the questions get asked, what is the purpose of the rapture? Why do we have this resurrection? What's the point of it? Um, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're done there with the book of Revelation. I just wanted to show you those similarities there. Matthew 24 with Revelation chapter 6. What is the purpose of the rapture? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Okay? Now, some will sleep, pass away and die, and others will be changed. You know some people say, I've, I've heard people say, oh, I really want to make it to the rapture. I really want to make it to the resurrection. I hope I don't die before that. Even if you die, you're, you're making it. <laughs> In fact, if you die, you get to go first. You get to experience the rapture first before those that are alive. So don't worry, every believer is going to experience the rapture, even if you pass away before any of these events take place. So we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Remember I was talking about this reference being about our bodies and not about the whole rapture event? In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Now, uh, I won't cover that right now. Last trump, we can talk about that some other time. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now look at this in verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. What is corruptible? What is this corruption? It's talking about physical bodies. Our bodies that we have right now are corruptible bodies. You know, corruptible means it can decay. It's putrid. You know, it's wicked. It's dishonest. You know, the sins that we commit are done in our flesh. 
are done in this body. You know, it's a sinful nature. It's corruptible. But then we're going to exchange that corruptible body, this corruptible body, for an incorruptible body. What does it mean to be incorruptible? Cannot be tainted, cannot decay. It is perfect and without fault. We're going to get a perfect body, resurrected body, just like the one that Jesus Christ received when he was resurrected. But also that, and this mortal must put on immortality. What does it mean to be mortal? It means it's, our bodies are perishable. You know, we're subject to death, right? When we talk about you know, being mortal and someone that's immortal, it says this mortal will put on immortality. It's an amazing thought. We're going to become immortal, like physically. <laughs> I know we can't die spiritually because we're born again, we're children of God, but our physical bodies, we're going to get these immortal bodies. Immortal means it cannot die, it endures, it's eternal, it's a body which lasts forever. It's going to be tangible, right? Heaven is not this, this uh, spiritual, intangible world, No, it's physical. New heavens and new earth, we're going to be preaching about that on Sunday. Physical, physical bodies. Bodies that can work. Bodies that can eat and drink, though it says we don't have to. But it can do those things, okay? It can function like a body, like a proper body. Now look at verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying... That is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now, don't ignore that. That's important. So many people read this passage and just ignore that. When we receive our resurrected bodies, that that is the point of the rapture, to receive our resurrected bodies. It's called the resurrection. So the fullness of our salvation takes place. Not only, only is our soul saved, not only are we quickened in the spirit right now, but we're going to receive these new bodies, and that'll be the fullness of our salvation received at that point in time. Okay? But when that takes place, it says, Then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? Right? O grave, where is thy victory? Why? Why, O death, where is thy sting? What's the sting of death? It's because, you know, to die is not a nice thing. You know, that sting of death is gone. Where is it? Because we've got immortal bodies. It can never die anymore. O grave, where is thy victory? Why? Because these graves are going to be opened up and these bodies are going to be raised incorruptible. No longer will those graves of of passed away believers be be holding onto those dead, decaying bodies. You know, there's no victory anymore in the grave, right? Resurrection takes place. Verse 16. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. Why is it saying that? The sting of death is sin. It's because our new, incorruptible, immortal bodies cannot sin. They will be sinless bodies, without corruption, right? This is the point of the rapture. This is the point of the resurrection. And verse 57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what had the victory before? The grave, right? No more the grave. We have the victory. We have the victory of the grave. We're never going to die ever again. We have perfect resurrected bodies. Now, what shall, it says, and shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. That's found in Isaiah 25. Okay? I'll read it to you. Isaiah 25, verse 8. Take reference of this. Very, very important. I've never heard anyone preach this. It was in my own study time. I went through this stuff. I've never heard it preached before. Isaiah 25, verse 8 and 9. And you know I'm not making this up, okay? Because it's in the Bible. Do your own reading yourself. Isaiah 25, verse 8 and 9 says this. He will swallow up death in victory. So when Paul is quoting that verse, it's coming from Isaiah, okay? Isaiah 25 verse 8. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord, look at this, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. Where did you read about that? Revelation chapter 7, the one that's supposedly not for the believer. Is 1 Corinthians 15... The rapture there, is that for believers? New Testament believers? Yes. Right? It's to the Corinthian church. It's to the church. What is Paul quoting? The Old Testament Isaiah, where death is swallowed up in victory. What is that event? The wiping away of our tears. Why? Because when we read Revelation chapter 7, we see these great multitude being brought before the throne of God, being raptured. And guess what? Their tears are wiped away from all their faces. So Revelation 7 is about us. You can prove that just comparing scriptures. It's very clear. And I'll just read verse number 9 in Isaiah 25, verse 9. 
and it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. This is Old Testament. What are we waiting for? The rapture, the resurrection. We, and the Old Testament's quoting this, we have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Why are we glad and rejoicing? Because all the tears have been wiped off our face, right? All the sorrow is gone. Your pain is over. Your suffering is over. Your tears are over. In exchange, God gives you eternal gladness, eternal rejoicing in his salvation. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Let's pray.